Largely what people know about free zones, I think, is wrong. They're not free. They're generally, or they cannot, they can be not zones, they cannot, they can be not in geographic areas. Um, so that essentially a free zone is an area where there is an alternative policy. Um, you do have traditional free zones, and, but I think we can start by saying there are really only four types of free zones. There are free zones that are wide area free zones, like the special economic zones of China that have resident populations. Um, you also have free zones that are small area, which is what most people think of. They're an enclosed geographical area like that industrial park that have special policies applying to them. But you also have performance specific free zones. India had a program where individuals, factories that were export oriented got special taxes, special treatment. You also have free zones that um, are industry specific. Most of the world banking centers are financial free zones. Um, and these sorts of, th these four zones are the four basic types. So when you talk about a free city, which is some people, as in the newspapers now or in the blogs, where free cities are for, say, refugees. I actually proposed that for the Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan in 1995. And I was told by the King of Jordan that they don't want those camps to be permanent settlements. I was saying, you know, by the time you've gotten to the fourth generation of people being born in refugee camps, you really ought to think about integrating them rather than maintaining the separation. And his reaction is, no, we want the separation that keeps the issue hot. We don't want to have a viable economic city there. We want a hotbed of radicals there. So one point on free zones is, by and large, they have to be created within the political and social structure that we're already in. I saw recently, for example, an article saying that uh, Tahiti has signed an agreement with uh, the Sea Setting Institute for floating islands um, that will have special administrative rights. Sea Setting has been around at least since 2005, I think, maybe even longer, uh, Petrie Friedman, who I've met. Um, and there, the state has begun to get an interest because they're afraid that sea level risers are going to wipe out Tahiti as a place to live. Um, and so having floating islands, building that technology, if they can get somebody else to build that technology on their dollar, it provides a potential future for the state of Tahiti, and there's a little opening there. Um, so that's taking advantage of the fact that you have to create them within the current state structure. But now you found a sort of a, a loophole where the states may have an interest aligned with you in creating something that is different, um, or that has a different type of technology where a state can be on a non-permanent land area. Um, therefore, let me say that those four types, and by the way, that would be a small area free zone because it's on a defined island, but it would not, it would have resident population. Um, it would probably not be industry specific or performance specific. Free zones issues have gotten much more complicated over the last 30 years. Because when it started, many developing countries had problems with exports because of their tariff rules, their trade policy, maybe something to do with financial policies. 
and you could create a, z a zone where you could transact current uh, tra do transactions in dollars. Sometimes they didn't allow you the right to form a corporation if you were a foreigner. So they could create this specified area that says, okay, in this area you can form a corporation. That, in fact, was the start of the United Arab Emirates, free zones, people have heard of Dubai. Um, Sultan Ben Suleyam, who started the Jebel Ali free zone, the first zone, free zone there, and I were standing on the sand there looking at them digging a $4 billion hole in the ground that eventually became the Jebel Ali port. And he says, Sheikh Mohammed, who is the current ruler, but was at that time the son of the ruler, says we should have a free zone here. But I've looked in the literature and the free zones are tax-free, duty-free. And we in the United Arab Emirates don't have taxes and don't have duty. <coughs> so why do we need a free zone? The important thing to ask yourself if you're in a situation where you're not happy with where you are is, why aren't you getting, in this case, the types and quantities of investments you want? And his answer was, well, you have to be 51% Arab owned. And so I said, can you form a free zone corporation that can be 100% foreign owned? And he goes, I don't know. And he turned to Sheikh Mohammed. He said, Sheikh, could we do something like that? And Mohammed thought for a moment and said, yeah, I think we could. And that started the free zone movement in the United Arab Emirates. The free zone corporation could be 100% foreign owned. It was the first time in the Middle East that you could put, say, a regional warehouse and not share 50% of it with a local, and then ship goods to Saudi Arabia where you have to share 50% again with a local, so that you as Caterpillar, say, only got 25% of the sales to Saudi Arabia because you had these locals being involved. Um, it changed the nature of the economy in the United Arab Emirates. Since that time, you've done such things as what was called the um, uh, International Financial Center, city. Um, there, we were able to realize that you don't, didn't have big international finance operations in the Middle East because you can't do it under Islamic banking law. And so we did a very unique thing there, is you know, I can put British commercial law into a piece of territory in the United Arab Emirates and I don't even have to ask Britain about it. And British commercial law, insurance companies and bankers are very accustomed to that. And if they could do business in the Middle East under British law, and I hired a few retired British judges, established a court of first opinion, the appeals to that eventually ends up in the House of Lords. How does that happen? Because I write in my contract, every contract signed in that area, that it's governed by the laws of the United Kingdom. You know, you can even have an office in London that is the excuse for why that office requires that the contract be uh, covered by British law. Suddenly I've got 70 or 100 acres in the middle of the <coughs> Middle East with full British commercial law. Pretty neat. So, the, the second thing that is important to understand is free zones can be, in many ways, less than you think. They're not free, I said. Um, but the smallest one is actually a single safe deposit box in Amsterdam, dealing with the diamond trade. The biggest one is 33,000 square kilometers. It's in China, and that's the entire island of Hainan, southern island. Population, I think, of 23 million. They can be as simple as New York has what's called an insurance-free zone. Probably never heard of it. In order for big insurance companies 
to operate in New York City, they had to exclude insurance policies of more than $100,000 premium. How much you pay. Yeah. That's a big policy. From oversight by the New York Insurance Commission. Now, I gotta guarantee you, if you're paying $100,000 for an insurance policy, you probably are more sophisticated than the New York Insurance Commissioner. <laughs> and to have him enter into the middle of your transaction would keep you from locating there. And so that's, well, that free zone was created with one line in one law. At the other extreme, you have Hong Kong, which has a separate constitution. And between there, then, you pretty much can do whatever you can achieve politically within the current state system. And that's the problem. In Honduras, we've been trying to create a, essentially a, a free city. Now, I wrote the Free Zone Law uh, for Honduras back in 1986, I think it was, and it was considered, it's considered now the most effective economic development program in Honduran history. It created 400,000 jobs. So I got asked about what was going on, and this involved at, at one point Paul Romer, and he had this charter city idea, and I talked to him a couple of times and said it was nonsense because he was going to have the Prime Minister of Canada be the executive authority in a Honduran free zone. Anyone see a problem with that? Like neocolonialism? Um, politically, you can't do that. So, some people came up with a, developed a law <coughs> that essentially allowed this area in Honduras to create its own laws. And they were very complicated and specific about how they were going to do that. <coughs> the Supreme Court in Honduras ruled that illegal. Well, I got asked about this about this time, and I said, well, first thing is read the Honduran Municipal Law, and it allows you to do about 90% of what you want to do. It's just it's not being done. And so really, you only need a law that changes about 10% of the rules in Honduras, not 100%. That's a lot easier to do and a lot more likely to get through the Constitution. They've passed that and there's some political problems, but that's still slowly moving forward and, 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 and may occur. Part of the problem is they've got a bad group of investors in there. Um, for a while they were dealing with the Koreans and the Koreans are, 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 are very poor in terms of labor standards with their offshore factories. Um, has to do with their also being very poor in Korea with the labor standards in their factories. Um, but that's responding to the fact that, and what I started with earlier, is the early free zones could get you involved, the Asian tigers, with exports, manufacturing, production, etc., by changing a few financial rules, a few trade rules, and not much else. By the time we reach today, it's some social behavioral issues that have to be changed, police force behavior, justice system. It intrudes a great deal more on the economy or on the culture of the country than does the old-fashioned export processing zone. When you went into Korea, by and large, you didn't have to worry about the legal system being corrupt. It actually was a reasonably good legal system. So you could start free zones there that dealt with just the trade issues that you would charge no tariff, import, export. By the way, WikiLeaks used to say, or, uh, Wikipedia used to say free zones had no customs oversight. That's not true. Every free zone has customs oversight but they operate under either a separate chapter or there are separate rules. In some cases, we've been able to establish that there's a separate customs organization because the first customs organization is so corrupt, the main country one. Or they operate with some se separate rules. For example, in China, the export processing zones 
are the only place where you can get electronic clearance for customs. If you are an importer or an exporter, that's a value to you. If you're not an importer or exporter, it's of no value to you. The other reason why things have gotten more complicated is not only do we have to deal sometimes now with, with sort of social and political issues, um, but the World Trade Organization has prohibited incentives for certain types, uh, ha has prohibited certain types of incentives for exports. Now that doesn't uh, prevent you from offering incentives. It just prevents you from offering them for exports. And so you have to be a little bit more clever about how you give your tax exemptions or how you give your, uh, your other benefits. And that's the Chinese law is in China. Efficient customs is not an incentive according to the WTO. But boy, is it a value. <laughs> Training workers is not an incentive. Secure working conditions are not an incentive. It has to be a monetary exchange. Discounted utilities would be an incentive if they were going only to exporters. So don't put the requirement in that the company has to be an exporter. Say they have to invest more than a million dollars. An incentive based on investment is not prohibited by the WTO. Only an incentive based on export or import. I, as I've always said about laws, and what got me involved a lot in the free zone is, you've got to read the white space between the letters. What's not said? And there's usually more in the white space than in the black lettering. And that essentially now, when I go to a country, what I do is, there are a number of indexes that look at the best in the world in terms of legal, financial, property ownership, uh, labor laws, etc. In Hong Kong or Singapore, it usually comes out on top. And then I look at where whatever country I'm in is. And the free zone uh, program should close that gap. And nowadays, more and more of those are occurring outside of financial and trade. Like in the United Arab Emirates, it had to do with business law and rights of ownership. Um, in China, the special economic zones, as I said earlier tonight to one of the guests, when I got there in 1980, there was no corporate law. There was no labor law. There was no real estate law. There's still commies. <laughs> Every economic activity was a department of government. <clears throat> if I brought equipment into China, <clears throat> the moment it crossed the border, I had the, lost the right, legally, to specify who worked on it, where it was located. Why would I do that? Well, what I did instead was, we negotiated a special investment decree that applied only to our company. The constitutions don't forbid private laws in a sense. That gave me the right to manage the equipment, gave me the ownership of it, allowed me to establish an entity that was partially outside of government. And a third of what our, our private investment decree was became the foreign, uh, the corporate uh, uh, law and the foreign investment laws five years later for China. Um, but we had to look at what was it that I needed to operate a factory? And one of the things is, officially I became overseas Chinese. I'm sure it was because of my appearance. <laughs> um, because they didn't have a visa that would allow me entry into China multiple times at, the at that time. And it took a week or two to get a visa. And I said, I'm not going to run a factory if I can in China if I can't get to the factory on a day's notice. And so their solution was to make me honorary overseas Chinese and give me an overseas Chinese identity card which didn't need a visa. Now since then, they've come up with multiple re-entry visas and so on and so forth. My point in saying that is, you can change almost anything if you can get the political will of the country on your side. 
So the, the, the second rule is free zones can be anything you can imagine if you can find the opportunity to negotiate them. Um, one example of a free zone that worked very well and very quickly is in Jordan, the qualified industrial zone. During the peace process between Jordan and Israel, everybody started talking about the peace dividend. And I was in a room with Warren Christopher and Ron Brown, and I'd known Ron Brown for some other reasons. And I said, what are you going to do to create a peace dividend? And he's, they said, it'll just happen. He said, what are you doing in government if you think things like that just happen? And Ron Brown says, what do you have in mind? Said, Would you allow a product jointly produced by an Israeli company and a Jordanian company to enter the United States duty free? And they looked at each other and said, I think we could do that. And that became the Qualified Industrial Zone created 70,000 jobs in Jordan, and it's the reason why Jordan and Israel never talked about breaking the peace treaty. Because that's a fair portion of the Jordanian, created one and a half billion dollars of trade between Jordan and the United States, up from about 12 million. In five years. That's the power of a free zone concept if you hit the right uh, political seam at the right time. Any questions people want to ask? Want to do questions? Yeah.